Good morning. Good morning. And welcome in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Easter celebration continues as we look at the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we recognize the victory that he has won, not just for himself, but for each and every one of us, crushing the ancient serpent's head and giving us not just hope, but the guarantee of everlasting life through his cross and through his empty tomb. This morning, our Lord comes to us through the words of divine service setting for as printed in the bulletin, and we rise to make our beginning. As we gather in the presence of the one true and triune God, we look to our baptism, where God himself called us by name, declared us to be his beloved children, and made us heirs of his eternal kingdom of heaven. And so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our health is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> a little while, and you will see me no longer. I will extol you, my God and King. Bless you Every day I will bless you. The Lord is gracious and merciful. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. A little while, and you will see me no longer.
Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise. That among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading appointed for this, the fifth Sunday of Easter, comes from the Acts of the Apostles, the eighth chapter. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation, for his life is taken away from the earth? And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And this is the word of the Lord. Christ has risen from the dead. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle reading, which serves in the text for our sermon this morning, comes from the first letter of St. John, the fourth chapter. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Rise and sing the Alleluia and verse.
Holy Gospel comes to us according to St. John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. And this is the gospel of our Lord. Let us confess to the world our God-given faith as we speak together the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've been to some of our Bible studies or taken the time to read the letters and books of St. John, you know that he has a particular style. He has certain themes that he weaves throughout the writings, themes that he continually comes back to in a circular fashion. Some of those themes include love, being children of God, and darkness and light. And he weaves these themes so artistically throughout his writings that they almost sound like poetry. Because of that, some people think that John was kind of a hippie, a spacey guy who walked around barefoot telling everyone to chill and offering free hugs. And they assume that the core message of his writings is just be nice to each other. But to think that of John is very, very wrong. Yes, he writes in a very poetic Eastern style that seems strange and lilting to our Western ears. But what he writes is God's word. And in that word, we have some very deep subjects, some very serious warnings. Take, for instance, our epistle reading today from 1 John. John is not giving advice on how to live a happier life free of all your possessions. He isn't sharing his special brownie recipe. He's talking about the spiritual warfare that takes place around us all the time and the powers of darkness that seek to destroy us. Specifically, here he talks about the spirit of the Antichrist. And that is some pretty heavy stuff, man. Well, thanks to horror movies and pop culture, when we hear about the Antichrist, we typically think of a person who is the embodiment of evil. Sometimes we think of a child that seems polite and innocent enough, but is manipulative and deeply disturbed. Or we think of a charismatic but demon-possessed man who seeks to rule the world. Or we might even think of some of the rock star posers like Marilyn Manson that pretend they're evil, have 666 splashed all over everything, and tend to share certain, even claim the title of Antichrist for themselves. Interesting side note, the hymn that we just sang was purposely put as number 666 as it mocks the devil's power and says, don't be afraid of this stuff because God is the victor. But anyway, whatever images may come to mind, they all tend to share certain traits. We think of the Antichrist as dark and evil, brooding and violent, but we also think of them as human. And we know that no matter how much destruction they may bring down, the good guys will always find his weakness, and the Antichrist is destroyed in the end, but probably comes back with a jump scare after the credits so they can make a sequel. Now, sadly, because of these cartoonish, stereotypical portrayals of the Antichrist in our culture, we've also come to think that it's not really real and that the Antichrist is just an idea, just a Hollywood trope, a story to scare people with. But John, like the rest of the Bible, makes it very clear that the Antichrist is real. God's word is infallible and given to every generation for our great benefit. And that word speaks very clearly about the spirit of the Antichrist here and elsewhere. And, where, and what it says is something very, very different from what the movies have led us to believe. For one thing, John does not give us any physical features to look for to easily identify the Antichrist. No flaming skulls, no distinctive scars, no aversions to garlic. In fact, he says that the Antichrist is difficult to spot. And a big reason for that is because the spirit of the Antichrist is far more extensive than the stories usually claim. John is not talking about one person in particular that you should watch out for and really try to avoid. He is talking about something more subtle, more widespread than one evil person with superhuman powers. He is talking about the demonic powers that lead to any form of opposition to Jesus Christ. Because that is what the word Antichrist means, against Christ, opposed to Jesus. 
So the spirit of the Antichrist is not just in one person that you can defeat if you have an old priest and a young priest and the right incantations. The spirit of the Antichrist is the ubiquitous evil that seems to fill every nook and cranny of our society and the entire world. And let's be honest, that's genuinely scary. John says that the spirit of the Antichrist is everywhere. He warns Christians to test the spirits, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. He says that every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. The devil loves to pretend that he is God and to deceive God's creation into putting their faith in him instead. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, claiming to be from God, but bringing his word of death and destruction instead. The spirit of the Antichrist speaks lies in the names of Jesus, twists God's word, seeks to take your attention away from Jesus and put it anywhere else. Your bank account, your health, the world, the climate, social justice, feelings, the pastor, anything at all that you are focused on as long as it isn't the truth of Jesus. These are the false religions, the pastors proclaiming false doctrine even if they think they mean well, because we all know which road is paved with good intentions. But it's more than just heretics, false religions. John also says that those held by the spirit of the Antichrist speak from the world and the world listens to them. The Antichrist doesn't have to be overtly religious. The devil's goal is not necessarily to convert the world to Satanism and have all people worship him in black robes. He actually cares less about his own glory than he does about demeaning God's glory. Most Satanism isn't a religion of itself as much as it is a mockery of the truth of Christianity. The symbols of Satanism, the upside-down cross, saying the Lord's Prayer backwards, using black and dark instead of light things, the devil has nothing of his own to offer. So he simply has to tear down the good gifts that God has given. And so the spirit of the Antichrist does that as well. Have you looked around at our society and wondered how we got here? How can so many people buy into this chaos and corruption and insanity? How can violence and bloodshed be ignored and promoted while virtue and decency is mocked and outlawed? How? Well, as John writes, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. The Antichrist tries to convince the world that God is not real that he is unnecessary, that his ways are oppressive and hateful and outdated, and we can do better. And that's been his MO from the beginning. And so when our society listens and turns from God, it also turns away from the orderliness in which God created this world. Marriage is despised by the Antichrist because that is the one institution that carried over from before the fall into sin. So those who oppose Christ hate it, seek to belittle it, make it temporary, disposable, unnecessary. Redefine it to be anyone and anything that you want as long as it isn't what God is saying. Even basic biology, which God gave us as a blessing, is under attack. God created us male and female, different and complementary. So the world says that it's all a shifting scale, that you decide who you are, not your DNA, and that the whole world has to play along with whatever whim you are feeling today, or they are hateful bigots. The chaos that we see in our streets and in our politics, the corruption and greed that we see in our government, the panic and fear used by people to take more and more control of our lives, the academic hustlers who teach that everyone is a victim and everyone is an oppressor and that violence and anarchy are the only ways to change things, the spirit of self-indulgence that says you can define your own existence, reshape your reality, thumb your nose at God, and live however you want. All of this and so much more is the spirit of the Antichrist seeking to destroy and redefine the orderly way that God has created and maintained things. 
The spirit of the Antichrist fills our entire lives, even our very minds, seeking to lead us away from God, convincing us that whatever we feel in our heart or see in our society, that is far more reliable than what God says in his word. It's everywhere. It's overwhelming. It is seeking to devour us and our children and everyone. How can we possibly prevail in the face of such a powerful and pervasive enemy? Well, thankfully, John speaks of that as well. And just like he isn't some hippy-dippy peacenik when he talks about the spirit of the Antichrist, he isn't when he talks about the solution either. Here, too, John speaks with certainty, with conviction. He says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. There's how we win. There's how we stand against the spirit of the Antichrist, even as it fills every part of our lives. Do not rely on your own strength. Do not rely on politicians. Do not rely on podcast hosts or celebrities. Rely on God. For he is greater than he who is in the world. Just like we often sell John short and see him as this doe-eyed hugmeister, we too often sell God short as well. We think of him as an old man sitting on a throne far away. Someone that, if we're lucky, we'll get to visit someday. But God is greater than he who is in the world. He is the creator and ruler of all things. His might and authority are absolute, no matter how much the devil in the world might try to protest. With a word, he created the universe. And at his word, it will come to an end. No matter how much the devil may mock him and try to tear down what he has made, God rules. And the devil has no power whatsoever beyond what God in his infinite wisdom allows him. He is a snarling dog seeking to tear apart everything, but he is on a leash held by the almighty hand of God. With just a word, just a thought, God could turn everything around in our society. All the filth and the chaos and the hatred and depravity in our world, the tide could turn at any time, and we could see this gradual move back to common sense and virtue. Or... God could cause a wave of reason and godliness to sweep the world all at once and change everything overnight. Or he may not. And he may allow our wicked society to continue to reap from the seeds of godlessness that we have sown. We don't know. But what we do know is that our victory is not in what might happen. Our victory is in what has happened. As Christians, if we are just looking for a change in our society and our world, looking to just make things a little less evil around us, well, then the Antichrist has already won. Certainly, we want those things to happen, but that is not our ultimate goal. It is not our ultimate victory. Because no matter how good we might make this world, this world will come to an end. This world will always be flawed and broken and imperfect because of sin. And so we look to something even better that God has given to us. We do not hope for a better future. We boldly proclaim that we have been given one through the cross and the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. This is the certain joy that we have as children of God. We who are sinners... We who are so swayed by that spirit of the Antichrist, we who deserve nothing but wrath and eternal condemnation from Almighty God, instead we are given mercy and grace and forgiveness. We are cleansed of all the guilt and iniquity that bars us from God's sinless paradise of heaven. We are proclaimed holy, innocent, and righteous in the eyes of God himself. We are washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. While we were dead in our sin. Jesus Christ suffered and died in our place to pay our penalty. He sacrificed everything to purchase and win us from sin, death, and the devil, to beat down Satan and crush his head. Jesus is the propitiation of our sins, meaning that he has satisfied all the requirements of holiness in our place. 
He took upon himself all of our sin, and he gave to us his perfection and righteousness. He gave his innocent, holy, eternal life over to death on the cross so that we miserable sinners could be made his children. And he rose again from the grave so that we too may rise, so that he may dwell with us and we in him, even as we suffer under the spirit of the Antichrist, even as we ourselves continue to struggle with sin. And as we endure the sin and the wickedness of this world and our own heart, we are not abandoned as orphans, for God himself is with us always. His holy presence is not something that we have to look forward to, thinking that someday, somehow, we will be with him. Even now, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with us. He dwells within us, nurturing us, strengthening us for the fights that lie before us, protecting us from so many of Satan's assaults. He gives us his holy church, where we can gather together with our brothers and sisters in Christ, be built up and forgiven by his holy word, renewed and sanctified by his blessed sacraments. He is with us in our homes as we study and rejoice in his word to drive out the spirit of the Antichrist that seeks to rule us and our children. He assures us that no matter how slick-talking the devil might be, no matter how chaotic and wicked the world might get, no matter how strong the spirit of the Antichrist may appear to be, God is greater, and he is with us always. So little flock, fear not the foe. Be on your guard against the spirit of the Antichrist at all times, for it is everywhere, and it is subtle, and it is dangerous. It seeks to destroy you and drag you down to hell. But know that you are from God, and that you have overcome that wicked spirit because he himself has won the victory. The devil will try to convince you otherwise, will fill your head and your heart with lies and fear and doubts and alternatives to God's word and his ways. By the power of the Holy Spirit, stand fast, knowing that you have been given the victory. You are a child of God by the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansed, forgiven, and held by him. You are not of this world, and you can be bold to shine the light of Jesus Christ into the darkness of the lives of people around you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, by the faith that he has worked in your heart, you abide in him, and he in you. Test the spirits, the messages that you are bombarded with, to see if they proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ, and listen to only those who confess his glorious word, that by the cross of Jesus Christ alone, by his empty tomb alone, you are forgiven of every one of your sins, and eternal life in heaven is yours. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now that peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. O Lord God, Almighty Father, your only Son came in the flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. Protect us from all false teaching and the spirit of the Antichrist, that we may always confess Christ to be our only true God and remain faithful to him. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you have grafted us onto the vine of your Son. Prune us and cut off from us all sin and dead works, that we may always draw life from your Son Produce the fruits of faith and good works. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Almighty God, you have established your holy church and you guard and protect her from generation to generation. Bless the students of our seminaries who have received their first divine call this week and grant that they would be faithful ministers to your people where you have placed them. Raise up men who are willing to answer your call to be pastors, that our congregations may continually be kept in your word. Lord, in your mercy. O oh, Savior of all people, in the waters of baptism, you welcome sinners into your kingdom and give them life. Grant that we would always honor and extol this gift and let nothing prevent people from it. Bless those who celebrate their baptisms this week, including Linda, Rodney, Avery, Hannah, Tennille, Sidney, Duncan, Charlie, Donald, Joseph, and Retha. Lord, in your mercy. O gracious God, before sin entered into this world, you established holy matrimony, that husband and wife would be united for life. Bless our homes and our families, that we would fill our lives with your word. Protect our children from the spirit of the Antichrist that seeks to tear them away from your truth. Let your Holy Spirit guard and protect us, and move us to teach and to hear your word with joy at all times. Bless Joe and Jennifer and all those who celebrate anniversaries this week, and grant chastity and companionship to those who are not wed. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, give health and guidance to our president and all in authority, that they may serve honorably and in accord with your good order and your word. Strike down the spirit of lawlessness and wickedness that seeks to overwhelm our world. Turn back the tide of depravity and darkness, that we may live our lives in peace and godly contentment. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Merciful God, you hear and answer your children in their hour of need. Be with the sick and the suffering, those preparing for or recovering from surgery, those to whom death draws near, the addicted and the depressed, those who live in fear, the homebound, the lonely, those who struggle with mental illness, and all who suffer in any way of body, mind, or spirit, especially Bernita, Don, Delbert, Chad, Joy, Dick, Donna, all our shut-ins, those affected by the storms this week, and all those that we name in our hearts. Grant that they would bear their crosses with faith, ever looking to you, and so fix their hearts where true joy is found. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Father, you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Into your almighty hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting that you hear and answer our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. You may be seated for our closing hymn.
may be seated. Again, a welcome to all of you, and what a joy it is to gather together in God's holy presence to hear his warnings about the spirit of the Antichrist that fills this world and seeks to devour us, but to hear the glorious truth that he is stronger than that spirit, that all things are in his hands, and that he has won the victory for us through the cross and the empty tomb of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's richest blessings to each and every one of you on the rest of your week, and may he bring you back safely to his holy house in the days and weeks to come.